Hello, I am Lord Cadrian de Flynn, and I am a wizard. Hello, I am Lord Cadrian de Flynn, your host. And before we go into this episode of Ask the Wizard, the Warden has drafted up something for me to re Huh? Oh, I have something that I wish to uh, share with you. I, Cadrian de Flynn, uh, did in a previous unauthorized uh, version of Ask the Wizard, uh, did send forth a message that was not entirely true. Um, the, uh, the things that were said were more of an act of magical sabotage than actual truth. Um, so you should disregard anything that was said in the prior Ask the Wizard, as, uh, there was... Uh, some tampering that was that was done cl clearly, clearly. You will going forward hear no mention of neck naughty magics at all. Uh, we will we will be staying away from that and only to uplifting subjects for the magical and mundane alike. Uh, so, uh, without uh, further ado, um, uh, uh, we, we, we had some uh, battered dwarf potatoes the other day. That was, was, was nice. Um, uh, the morning dell flowers are blooming nicely. Um, why, why don't we just get on to the question uh, for, for today? Um, as my wand has been uh, confiscated for investigation, uh, I will read the submission uh, which has been handed to me by the warden's primary th guard. <clears throat> guard. And it reads, To the seer proclaiming himself the Lord Cadrian, expert in all things magic. Well, that is my name, Cadrian, and, uh, well, as a diviner, I know a great deal about magics. So, anyhow, uh, my name's Oriar Oraric Swifthand, member of the Silver Claws Adventuring Company, and senior scout. I also am responsible for keeping the company ledgers and balancing the books such as they are. Now, the Silver Claws have been in existence for several generations. And during that time, have seen a number of wizards, mages, illusionists, and the odd something or another caster. In nearly all cases, these, quotation marks, Masters of Magical Conjuring, and quotation marks, have all made ridiculous demands on the company coffers, save, perhaps, for Ampharia of the Blue Star, who's some sort of sorceress. Demands that far outweigh the needs of, well pretty much the entirety of the rest of the company. If these, quotation marks, components, end quotation marks, you see, 
These demands for things like ground diamond, splinter frog spleens, and something called terra terra slime. It's actually quite good on toast. Whatever that is, uh, take a considerable bite out of the purse. I'm sure, quotation marks, you, quotation marks, understand what I'm saying here. Some of these things are so rare, so expensive, it's hard to buy into the whole thing without thinking, quotation marks, gee, someone saving up for a tower on a remote ridge in the middle of some enchanted swamp or forest or whatever, end quotation marks. I mean, just the other day, I found Cedric the Cynical. Cedric is not the only one here who is cynical, it appears. Using some sort of magical pestle and expensive-looking stone bowl. It's called, a, it's called a mortar. You use a pestle and mortar. To grind up half of the rubies in our traveling strongbox. Incredulous, I demanded that he desist and explain just how and why he needed so many. I also demand to know how he got past the locked and warded chest in the first place. But he merely grinned, his ever preened beard flapping the way it does when there's a good breeze. Enchanted beards are good. By all the gods, goddesses, and the divine treasure hordes, it was enough rubies to set up a medium-sized family in a good house, so about 50 gold pieces, or give an honest scout a king's weekend, if you're willing to lower your standards. Besides... I'm the one who has to keep explaining to the rest of the company why such a large percentage of swag goes to Sidric. Be honest. As a diviner, I can be but honest, but very well. You wizards are just trying to pad the bottom line. You know, putting some away for that tower you all seem to crave. Towers are very nice pieces of architecture. I get it. I do. But come on. Why, when I first started out and was adventuring with Derrico, the magical wonder, all he ever had to do was collect some spider webs, dust, and the odd turkey bone. Turkey bones have a great deal of magical power, I bet you didn't know that. Kinda miss old Derrico. Sad that his attempt to shrink a large, nasty spider ended up on it growing three times in size. That is not uncommon for inexperienced wizards. Apparently, it became too heavy for its web and fell, taking out most of the party. Anyway, I digress. Yes, you have. Apparently, it must, quotation marks, always, end quotation marks, be something bizarre, expensive, and darn near impossible to procure. Blue dragon spit? What sort of maniac collects dragon's drool of any sort? Sincerely, Auroric Swift Hand, professional scout and treasure for the Silver Claws Adventuring Company. Very interesting. Clearly, Master Auroric is not of my world. He's from one of the far flung worlds where. Bands of adventurers gather together in companies. Not uncommon. In worlds where adventurers fill in certain roles and rarely drift across uh, the 
uh, eventual skills of these roles, uh, you can often have these members banding together for the mutual convenience of getting by obstacles that would be impossible or difficult for those without the skills to do so. In turn, they share the risks and the rewards and are able to take on stronger and more varied challenges than any one or uh, a group of a single role can do. These companies can grow to be quite large and quite profitable, and rather famous or infamous, depending on their bent. Now, uh, these companies can be akin to mercenaries, uh, but sometimes they can also uh, be freebooters, uh, not taking a military charter, but solving problems, uh, which can be in the guise of quests or... Uh, fat contracts from those who uh, wish to have some feat done. One of the things that these companies often have in common, and frankly should, is a charter, which is a often a document, but it is an agreement that all members will adhere to. This charter denotes what tasks belong to what roles, how treasure is to be divided, and the general behavior which governs the company. Without a charter, all you are is a band, basically on the fly agreeing what to do and where to go, who to help and what monsters to kill. By saying that you uh, and your, at least that your company has survived for several generations, uh, meaning you've seen plenty of fresh faces, they continue to find it mutually profitable to be a member of your group, and uh, that it has managed to survive several such ventures, suggests that you have at least the inkling of a charter, and therefore you should have some basic rules governing the behaviors of your group. If your wizards can feel free to rummage through your strong boxes. Either your charter is very loose, or your wizard is unlawful, in which case it is up to the rest of the company to deal with such behavior. Perhaps your charter has bylaws regarding who can do what with the money. If this Cedric is just uh, following the rules of the charter, then you really have no business complaining. So, hopefully... You have some basic understanding when this whole company was formed on how people were going to be rewarded and the general costs, how they were going to be dealt with as your company. Many companies, for instance, have provisions for the members so that they can be accommodated as far as gear that they require and supplies that they will need as they continue under the auspices of the company. Let's take two people that seem to mystify you. We'll take a warrior and we'll take a wizard. Your warrior, to uh, be a fit member of your group, must have armor of some sort to protect his flesh and keep him upright, perhaps a shield to put between himself and danger, a weapon, certainly, to maintain his threat so that uh, the monsters must take him seriously, and that he may wreak harm unto the foes of the company. Perhaps a few extra weapons, because one rarely takes care of all situations. So, you've invested, without even going into things like food, lighting supplies, etc., etc., uh, so an amount of money and value in that warrior. The cost of good armor can be expensive, prohibitively expensive for a starting adventurer, so the company absorbing those funds gains the allegiance of the warrior who is wearing uh, the tithe that the company has invested in the warrior. Take the wizard. The wizard wears no or little armor. The wizard carries but few weapons, and none of them very expensive. A staff? You can cut those from a tree. Daggers? 
common as stones and not very expensive. Most of the cost that the wizard has is already been paid for up front during their apprenticeship. It's what they know. Their spell book is not something that's often paid for by the company, so the wizard has very little upfront cost. Now, as you've noted, and I'm certain that Orarik is no spellcaster, so he does not understand the complexities involved with being a spellcaster, that your first spellcaster that you had experience with was not very powerful. Uh, simply uh, rummaging around for scraps and materials to cast, frankly, weak spells is the hallmark of someone just turned out of their apprenticeship. And this uh, Derrico uh, certainly may have been a fit companion for you at the time, but I also uh, feel that I can safely assume that he knew of no great magics. Therefore, the rule, generally, with magic is that the greater the power, the greater the, the payment that must be preferred. A certain portion of that payment, of course, is done by the will and interior strength of the wizard. Uh, without that capacity for handling power, um, the wizard cannot cast such a powerful spell as, um, say, a shower of meteor from the sky to smite an army of orcs. An apprentice may be able to fling a bolt of fire from their hand and, you know, cook an orc or a goblin. But when you are facing greater foes, greater magics are required if that wizard is to be truly effective. That is why you adventuring types often keep a wizard around to take care of those things that a, a, sim a single sword cannot, or a, a rogue creeping in the shadows cannot. Wizards can do many things that normal men find impossible. And these have a cost. The greater the power, oftentimes the greater the cost, go both to the wizard themselves in terms of their personal power and reserves, but also many of the spells in, in certain worlds uh, that obey this rule of scaling power with cost is that to cast a particularly powerful spell, not only must the wizard understand the spell implicitly and have the formula in their mind, they must know the correct gesticulations, movement, they must know the incantation and be able to utter it. But many of those spells also require something else to channel and unlock that power. That item is often something that is consumed by the spell itself. A component, as you say. Well, following certain types of rules of magic, these components are an indelible part of a wizard's repertoire. It's what they carry because they need them to be able to use the full range of the magics they understand. Without these things, their magic doesn't work. Now, in the example of you know, scaling, if all you need your wizard for is to fling bolts of fire and smite a single goblin or smite a single orc, well, you can hire any bow-toting clod for that. Killing a foe at a distance is something any ranger can do. Uh, many warriors are provisioned with bows and can do the same. But you... you want a wizard. You want somebody who can bend reality to their will who has more depth of magic and can be the key to solving particularly nasty locks, bypassing all sorts of obstacles, ensuring victory in fights that otherwise would be very much in doubt. That army of gnolls that I referenced earlier that could be destroyed by a stinging rain of meteors, well, that's powerful magic. If your warriors and your rogues and cut purses fought those gnolls, they might take losses. They might die or get badly injured. Your supplies might be used up. The arrows that that ranger fires may not be recovered. Uh, the potions of healing to keep your warriors upright, that's an, uh, certainly an expense as well. You might find that clearing that obstacle by allowing the 
sorcerer to use that ground-up ruby to cast his rain of fire upon your foes to be the more efficient way of going about business. If that is the case, you have elevated your group by taking advantage of this bounty of magic that has been blessed to your company that you so seem to take for granted. If that is the case, go ahead. Tell them they can no longer access the coffers of the company. Tell them that any spell components must come from their own share of the treasure. Watch how quickly that magical spring dries up, eh? Or perhaps not. I have known of companies that an equal share amongst all members uh, is agreed upon and accepted. The wizards of such a group pay their own costs for their scrolls and papers and learning and tutelage and new spells and components. They settle for common spells that don't require very much or things that can be commonly found so that their costs do not outweigh what they end up taking in from their adventuring. In just the same way that uh, that warrior that's in that group must pay for better and better arms and armor, uh, perhaps an enchanted weapon down the road, well, if the company doesn't pay for those things, then, assuming an even distribution of treasure, the wizard must therefore also throttle back the magic that they can throw, because they have to draft out of their own funds. So, I certainly don't know all of the details about your cynical friend and his abilities, except that he either has diverged into being a lockpick, or his magic has easily trumped your securities. You might want to fix that. If one of your own party members can have open access to your funds without your permission, odds are other people can as well. Security is not a bad idea if you are responsible for the wealth of an entire group of heavily armed people, or powerful wizards. <clears throat> now, that's all I'm going to say about your charters and your adventuring companies. As long as you have open transparency about where the money is going to, and you haven't been lining your own pockets, let's face it, you're an adventurer. You aren't just in this all for altruism. Money means something to you as a scout. You most certainly are aware that everything has a cost. And keeping a company going? Well, if you're going to look into the books and learn the true cost of doing business for your company, yes, of course. By all means, audit your spellcasters. Make them accountable for what they've spent. But bear in mind how much of what is spent may be applied to advancing the causes of your company, and perhaps put a value on that. Um, but that's just bookkeeping. I'm a wizard. I'm not an accountant. That is for you to decide. Now, one of the things that might help you is you don't seem to understand the value of these components. <sighs> Components are nothing less than a focus. That's really what they are. If you, as a spellcaster, and if you are in a world that obeys these laws, if you do not have this focus, that particular branch of magic or that spell that requires it is denied you. It would be a bit like having a warrior who has trained all of his life with the greatsword. He's amazing with the greatsword. He can take on giants by himself if that greatsword is in his hands. But there's a problem. He has to pay five gold every time he swings the greatsword. Does that sound ludicrous? It's the rules wizards work under, my friend. And if you don't have the spell components and you need them, it's hard to fake that. The universe does keep track oftentimes. So, if you don't have the ability to cast that spell when you need it, your company suffers, not just the wizard himself. If that wizard is not left to his own devices, uh, the company very well could suffer for the wizard not being able to do what you need him to do. 
And if you decide that a particular spell is too expensive, by all means, tell your wizard that. If he is a member of your group, and he understands the importance of camaraderie, he should understand some level of umbrage if he has a truly wasteful spell, or if he hasn't learned the discretion of when to cast the spell. Well, sometimes you have to train your young wizards as they're growing. <laughs> Believe me, I run an academy. I understand that all the time. Budgeting is one class that I myself teach. Uh, we tax the wizards, uh, the, the would-be wizards, and make them cast every spell they can until they're exhausted, wiped out. And then, an enchantment, an illusion, but a poignant one, a single goblin, armed with a short sword, comes upon these young wizards. What can they do? The smart ones, perhaps have managed to squirrel away one spell that I didn't know they had, and can still fry that goblin. Otherwise, do they throw daggers? Do they take their staves and prepare to smite the creature? It's interesting to know what you do when you have no resources that you commonly draw upon, but budgeting is an important part of a wizard's, well, what keeps them alive, truly. So, if you are having budgeting issues, again, you might want to look at your wizards a little bit more closely as well. But, as far as exotic things, well, the more powerful the magic, the more expensive the components quite often, or the more rare. If you are an adventuring company and you happen to find the different reagents that make the magic work, you're in luck. You've saved yourself some money, and you've possibly gained value that you otherwise would have left to rot on the floor. If you have a spellcaster whose worth is, well, worth anything in magic, they should be able to identify the things that can help them out, and ultimately perhaps help your company out. Listen to them and make allowances. They're making you value. You may as well use it. Um, dragon spit? Now, I don't know all of the rules of your world, but in my world, dragons are the most powerful monsters. They are created when war mages... <coughs> They're very rare. Not to be taken lightly. <sighs> but they are magic incarnate. Every part of them is magical and can be used as a focus or an amplifier for magic. Especially if the temperament of the dragon mirrors the kind of magics you wish to summon or draw upon. Dragon blood can be used as a battery for one's own powers. They could be used for potions, creation of magical items. In some worlds, dragons are more intelligent, less monstrous. Well, perhaps still monstrous, but intelligent. And some people are a bit squeamish about wearing things that used to belong to something that thinks. I myself find it distasteful and don't wear anything made from dragon, but... Um, they are monsters, and they do need to be put down from time to time, as rare as they are. And uh, when they do, they are harvested. Every part of them goes to a particular purpose. In my world, it's mandated by the state. It doesn't take long before the reeves close in and uh, take care of the disposition of the corpse. Your world may vary. If your world is one where they are not seen as, well, sacred, or you may have great profit in, in the slaying of such a creature, and taking and harvesting of its organs, and yes, even its spit. Sometimes being a wizard means doing unsightly things, or having truck with unsightly things. But a wizard recognizes where power is and can take advantage of it. 
So that is the wisdom that I have for you. Uh, if your wizards know more about the magic than you, I would recommend listening to the advice of the experts on the subject. As far as bringing value that otherwise you might lose, well, perhaps you can take that into account in the share of the treasure that they have earned, rightly. Um, but if you have any kind of an expense that your company drafts, a portion of that should possibly be going towards making sure that your spellcasters can use the magic your company requires. That is the wisdom that I have for you this day. I pray that it is useful, and I assure you that it is true. Uh, until the next time, I hope that you found this to be useful and will return to hear more from this wizard here still in wizard jail. I am Lord Cadrian de Flynn, your humble servant, and I pray that the gods of magic smile upon you in your ventures. Thank you, and farewell. <laughs>